This is Berg. It's nine days west of nostalgia and a few degrees southeast of my childhood inspirations. And this place is a special one to me. When I was young, this is the place I let my mind wander to when I wanted an escape from the dull and boring reality. I felt that, in my head, flying in the sky atop my imaginary dragon, I could conquer anything. Hello, I'm Jin Long the Night Fury, and you know what? DreamWorks is one odd studio. From its origin, vengeful ex-Disney employees, to the introduction of a cinematic masterpiece of a franchise, to this. The baby can talk! This is war! Their first actual film was a competition with Pixar's, followed by a few great 2D and stop-motion films. But it was with Shrek that DreamWorks really made their mark on the map. Following the success of Shrek, we had Spirit and Shrek 2, which many consider even better than the first. But then came something that ushered an era of really weird, forgettable, and sometimes downright ugly early 2000s films. It began with a movie by the name of Shark Tale. Everyone loved that one, right? And this movie saw the success of Shrek, and it wanted to be Shrek, so badly. It wanted the pop culture references, it wanted the celebrity voice actors and the odd-looking realistic models, but it ultimately failed to capture the essence of what made Shrek work. And then came Over the Hedge, and Flushed Away, and Shrek the Third, and B-Movie! Then, out of nowhere, they struck gold with Kung Fu Panda. It was a genuinely good movie, but ultimately the first movie alone wasn't strong enough to leave a lasting impact. They went back to weird again with Monsters vs. Aliens, but then... A DreamWorks movie that shook the theaters like it hadn't done since Shrek 2 came into being. On IMDb, it's listed as DreamWorks' best rated film to date. That movie was How to Train Your Dragon. It even beat Shrek! When this movie came out, people went ballistic over it. It went over to become one of DreamWorks' main franchises alongside Shrek and Kung Fu Panda. People fell in love with Hiccup and Toothless and the Vikings and the dragons in their world, including me. So what was it about this seemingly simple boy-and-his-dog tale that made it so solid and effective? While doing research for this video, I couldn't help but notice just how odd DreamWorks' films as a whole are. Some movies were incredible and managed to rival Disney and Pixar's masterful storytelling. Others were god-awful and would have been better if erased off the face of the Earth. They're also... hit or miss. I guess they never miss, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you stink! But How to Train a Dragon's success was absolutely massive. Marketable toothless plushies galore. It spawned two sequels, and not one, not two, but three TV shows. I've given all of those a watch, especially the sequels, and most people agree with me that although they do try to give continuity and expand on the universe and tell better stories with their world, they're just nowhere near the solid storytelling the first one was. And I want to explore why that is. Alright, so, one thing I noticed about DreamWorks movies in general. When we're looking at their most successful films, with the exception of Shrek, Prince of Egypt, Spirit, Kung Fu Panda, Rise of the Guardians, How to Train a Dragon, what do they all have in common? Well, they all tell tales of grand adventures, usually of a protagonist who is an outcast from society and does not fit in, and along the course of the story they beat the odds and fulfill their destiny while surrounded by rays of golden light and a dramatic orchestra score. They are typical hero's journey stories. Don't get me wrong, you can find parts of the hero's journey formula inserted in almost any story, but not to the dramatic emotional degree of the films I mentioned before. I also made Shrek an exception because Shrek is an anti-hero's journey. Not only that, but its soundtrack is a jukebox that actually cleverly works to the film's advantage. When did DreamWorks attempt to do that again? A five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, yeah, and it was painfully mediocre. But if all these stories follow the hero's journey so closely, why did How to Train Your Dragon manage to use that age-old model so effectively? To understand that, we first have to understand what is the hero's journey. In short, it's a narrative concept explained in the book The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell in 1949. After studying multiple stories and myths from around the world, as well as modern films and literature, Campbell claimed he had managed to map out a singular formula used in every single archetypal hero story. 
Especially nowadays, it's pretty understood that it doesn't apply to every single story ever told, but the building blocks of the hero's journey are definitely still there the closer your story is to resembling something along the lines of Greek myths or ancient legends. I'll be letting overly sarcastic productions explain it from here, because I think they did a much better job of summing it up than me. The idea is that this formula, this monomyth as he confidently calls it, covers everything from Gilgamesh and the Buddha all the way up to modern day and can be identified in a large number of stories in between. Now, while it's cool that so many different stories share common threads, which you may note is the definition of a trope in the first place, Campbell went a little overboard on trying to apply the rule to absolutely everything and assert that it was the only way hero stories can be told. But of course, no trope is omnipotent, and it's it's impossible to come to one formula for how all stories since forever have been written. For our purposes, let's take a less cavalier approach. The hero's journey is not a trope that all stories do or should follow as a strict formula, but rather, the trope works best when it serves as a lens through which to view and analyze a story. Think of it as a more detailed version of a three-act structure. There's no mandate that anyone has to write that way, but knowing about it and understanding how it works lets you analyze the story from this perspective and potentially identify interesting story components you might have otherwise overlooked. As Overly Sarcastic Productions beautifully explain, the hero's journey is a tool for literary analysis, a more detailed version of the three-act structure. The most recent modern model of the hero's journey looks like this. Yeah, I know it looks at least boring and at most intimidating, but let's take this step by step. Understanding how this model works is vital for understanding why How to Train Your Dragon works, and why Star Wars works, and why Lord of the Rings works, and why Dragon Ball works, and so on and so forth. Let's examine the hero's journey. Stage 1, The Ordinary World This is the very beginning. We get to see the normal state of the world. The hero is an ordinary person in their society like all of us. This stage is important, it grounds us into the reality of this world's rules and gives us a sense of the status quo of the universe. This is Burke. It's 12 days north of Hopeless and a few degrees south of freezing to death. My village. In a word, sturdy. We have fishing, hunting, and a charming view of the sunsets. But deep down, this stage always hints that there's something more to life than this. That there's an adventure on the brim of unfolding. In musicals, this stage is the breeding ground for I Want Songs. There must be more than this provincial life. I want more. Stage 2, Call to Adventure. The Call to Adventure is a narrative element to signify that destiny has summoned the hero. It could be a literal mystical call, like seeing a vision in a dream. Or it could be that the hero is faced with a great challenge, forcing them to let go of all they know. Could also be that somebody throws a rock through the hero's window and they venture out to find the culprit and discovers Bigfoot exists, I don't know. It's up to the hero to answer that call. <gasps> Stage 3, Refusal of the Call. The hero will almost always refuse the call in the beginning due to fear of the unknown and insecurities like all of us. Even if they attempt to accept, something will hold them back. There is often a consequence to them refusing, which in the end forces the hero's hand and they embark on the journey. If the hero has a parental figure or something similar, it usually results in Uncle Ben. This stage is optional, as some heroes never refuse the call at all. Either path leads to the story progressing. Stage 4, Meeting the Mentor The hero comes in contact with a figure of a mentor who gives them insight and advises them on their journey. It doesn't have to be a physical person, it could be a role model or idol they haven't met in real life. It could be a god the hero prays to, or even an inanimate object. As the saying goes, when the student is ready, the master appears. This stage doesn't necessarily always appear in this order. Some heroes have their mentors from the very beginning of the story. Stage 5, Crossing the First Threshold This is when the hero takes the first step into the unknown, into the special world. The point of no return. The world will never be the same. This stage could be the inciting incident, or it could not, depends. It's taking the red pill. Once that happens, there is no going back. How Trainer Dragon has this moment clearly identified and covered in highlighters for us.
As a little side note, for those who don't know, in story writing, the inciting incident is an important event during the three-act structure, usually Act 1. But it's not just any event, it's THE event. Once this event is triggered, it's a chain reaction and the entire story is set in motion. In Hatter Trainer Dragon, however, the inciting incident happens in a very curious way. But I'll explain more in detail later, it's part of the genius of this movie's writing. Stage 6, Tests, Allies, and Enemies the hero tests the waters and learns the rules of the new world. They might make new friends and allies, but at the same time face more challenges. The most important function of this stage is to test the hero to prepare them for the great ordeal that lies ahead. Stage 7, The Innermost Cave The Innermost Cave can take many forms. It can be an actual physical place wherein lies a terrible danger, or an inner conflict the hero hasn't faced yet. In a lot of myths, the hero has to descend into hell to save a loved one, or go to a cave to fight a dragon and get the treasure. In mythology, the dragon represents everything you fear most, guarding the most precious treasure. It's when you break through what you fear most that bears the biggest rewards or personal growth, but it's far from easy. Sometimes in this stage, the hero has to make a very tough decision. Hiccup, we just discovered the dragon's nest. The thing we've been after since Vikings first sailed here. And you want to keep it a secret? Well, uh, to protect your pet dragon? Are you serious? Yes. Stage 8, The Ordeal The hero is pitted against the greatest challenge they ever had to face. Usually at this stage is when the hero hits rock bottom. Only through a often metaphorical death can the hero be reborn, climbing their way out of the bottom that grants them the greater power or insight necessary to fulfill their destiny. This is a high point, where everything the hero knows and holds dear is put on the line. If they fail, disastrous consequences will follow. So everything in the ring... a trick? A lie? I screwed up. I, 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 I should have told you before now. I... Death. No! For once in your life, would you please just listen to me? You've thrown your lot in with them. You're not a Viking. You're not my son. Stage 9, The Reward After triumphing over the ordeal of the innermost cave, the hero receives a reward. It can be a physical treasure or object, knowledge and experience, maybe even love. It's the achievement of inner change. In The Lion King, Mufasa's ghost speaks to Simba to tell him his mission. Simba's reward here is a reassurance and quite literal reminder of who he is. What we often see in this stage is that sweet, crunchy, delicious character development. And we love that. You must feel horrible. You've lost everything. Your father, your tribe, your best friend. Thank you for summing that up. Why couldn't I have killed that dragon when I found him in the woods? The rest of us would have done it. So why didn't you? I couldn't. That's not an answer. Oh, for the love of... I, I was a coward. I was weak. I wouldn't kill a dragon. 300 years, and I'm the first Viking who wouldn't kill a dragon. First to ride one, though. I bet he's really frightened now. What are you gonna do about it? Probably something stupid. Good, but you've already done that. Then something crazy. Stage 10, The Road Back Now that the hero has claimed the treasure and been reborn, they're not out of the woods just yet. This stage marks the decision to return to the ordinary world. The hero comes to realize the special world must be left behind and there are still dangers and challenges ahead. Simba makes the decision to return to the Pride Lands and face Scar. Sometimes this stage has a temptation test, where the hero is tempted to abandon or leave their journey. Sometimes power is shifted between the hero and the antagonistic force. Wait, what are you- Shh, Max. It's okay. It's okay. You're gonna need something to help you hold on. Stage 11, Resurrection. This can often be referred to as the climax of the story, the final battle. 
danger is encountered one more time before being conquered for good. This is the highest the stakes have ever been. This is when the hero gathers all the wisdom and insight they collected from the reward. They wield the Excalibur. They become a different, more powerful version of themselves. This is the rebirth. This can represent the death of the ego and birth of innermost wisdom. The hero realizes they had the power within them the whole time and finally defeats the antagonistic force. You got it, bud. Pick up! I'm sorry. For, for everything. Yeah, me too. I'm proud to call you my son. Thanks, Dad. Stage 12, Return with the Elixir. Once the evil has been conquered, the hero returns to the ordinary world, but never quite the same as before. They've got a treasure, or a new understanding. Maybe the world has changed with them, or they're the one who changed. The hero can use the lessons they learned to heal their wounds and help others in the ordinary world. The elixir and the title refers mostly to the solution the hero found to the problem they encountered way back in the beginning. Once they set off on this quest, they return with the elixir, or the solution to the main conflict that prompted them to go in the first place. Turns out all we needed was a little more of this. You just gestured to all of me. You can see how I've managed to pretty much map out the entire movie onto the hero's journey model. You can map out all the Disney Renaissance films onto it that way, same for many pop culture movies like Marvel and so on. I wanted to show that How to Train a Dragon doesn't do anything revolutionary like deviating from the structure or anything like that. But it's the little details, the small tweaks they add in the narrative that makes this story feel very refreshing compared to your average old yeller boy and his dog or Disney Channel girl and her horse movies. For starters, the opening of the film. It begins like a lot of movies do, with opening narration, a la stage one of the hero's journey, Hiccup verbally explains to us what the status quo is. But then all of a sudden, boom, we're immediately thrown into Burke while chaos is going on. Why didn't it start while things are normal or when the village is in a more calm state? The movie immediately starts with a dragon attack, so many things going on at once, it's chaos! Well, to give us the narrative impression that Burke is in a state of negativity immediately. We follow the story through Hiccup's worldview, but even when he and everyone else thinks the state of the world is fine, we as an audience can sense it's not. We can sense there's a serious imbalance in the state of things, it's far from peaceful, and that it's on the brink of change when Hiccup hits the Night Fury. What makes the entire film work as a solid narrative can actually be tied down to the first 7 minutes of the movie. That entire opening scene with the dragon attacks? Yeah, that scene alone manages to tell us everything we need to know about the universe of this movie. All the way back in stage 1. The world rules and beliefs, the characters, their dynamics, and most importantly their motivations. And not only that, it also does it through cues in the music. I'll give credit to Sideways for the analysis on why the music is also masterful in this movie. He made brilliant observations for how each piece of music played in the very first scene all serve as character cues later in the film. When the movie begins, what's the first tune we hear? Misery. My village. In a word, sturdy. And it's been here for seven generations. This is Hiccup's theme. It plays whenever he's the focus of the scene, but most importantly when he's with Toothless. <laughs> Then the dragon attacks cut in. This tune is associated with the dragons. Most people would leave. Not us. We're Vikings. We have stubbornness issues. It's heard again when Toothless is out of control. Ah! Toothless! What is wrong with you? Mad dragon! <laughs> then the scene where Astrid is introduced. Astrid. This is Astrid's theme, and guess when it can be heard again? But probably the most important thing to pay attention to is this. The scene where Toothless is first introduced, there's a peculiar tune playing in the background. This is 
is his theme. When Toothless is hostile toward Hiccup, it can be heard on a minor scale. But then as they start bonding, you start hearing it on a major scale. Okay there, bud. Now watch what happens when Hiccup and Toothless are working together. The tunes merge into one. Just like Hiccup and Toothless are one, that connection is fortified even more by the music. The soundtrack isn't just any generic orchestra score to make your movie sound glorious, it serves a purpose, to amplify the themes in sound form. Now let's talk about the way the story makes small tweaks in the hero's journey. So let me ask you, remember stage 4? Meeting the mentor. Luke Skywalker has Obi-Wan Kenobi. Daniel has Mr. Miyagi. Hercules has Philoctetes. Who is Hiccup's mentor? His dad? Gobber? Granted, sometimes Gobber tries to have that mentor approach with him. Stop trying so hard to be something you're not. I just want to be one of you guys. <sighs> but he is not the one that provides him the necessary insight to complete his journey. What is the main antagonistic force in How to Train a Dragon? It's established right at the beginning that it's the dragons. They are the villains that must be battled and defeated. But that's the thing. Hiccup's mentors are the dragons. It's toothless. Hiccup obtains all the insight he uses at the climax of his journey from him. Toothless is the one to teach Hiccup the one crucial piece of information to win the final battle. <laughs> Not so fireproof on the inside, are you? Hold, Toothless. Now! The archetype of the antagonist ends up shifting towards Mentor. Then, who becomes the antagonist? It's the character that would, in most movies, be placed as the mentor. It's Hiccup's father. It's this subtle twist that really makes this kind of hero's journey very different from what we've seen before. By transforming the mentor figure into the antagonist, and the antagonist into the mentor. Another point. Remember stage 3? The refusal of the call. What is the call to adventure and how to train a dragon? It's when Hiccup shoots down and goes to investigate the Night Fury, right? So the refusal is when he literally refuses to kill Toothless. What would have happened if he didn't? If he had accepted? Everything was gonna change as he said before, he would have killed a dragon and become a hero. That was what the situation was calling him to do, right? But he refused the call. But the story proceeded to happen as a result of that. So, How to Train a Dragon's story unfolds with Hiccup's refusal of the call, rather than acceptance. In How to Train a Dragon, the refusal of the call is the inciting incident. This inverse flipping of the hero's journey can be hard to notice, but is very clever in telling what kind of hero Hiccup is. Hiccup lives in a world full of classical Herculean heroes. That's what the Vikings are. They're tough, they're brave, they never back down. They're all characters perfect to fit into a classical hero archetype, and Hiccup is not. He's the very opposite of what the classical protagonist on the hero's journey usually is. In these coming-of-age fantastical stories, usually the protagonist is a boy who is immature and naive, and eventually grows up and defeats his enemies in a literal fight. Simba is a hero because he fights his enemy, Scar. Hiccup is a hero because he refuses to fight his enemy, the dragons. Hiccup's greatest strength is not his muscles, it comes from his humanity, it's his empathy. I looked at him, and I saw myself. I mean, there's a war going on for generations between Vikings and dragons. It took a hero like Hiccup to solve the problem that an entire village of Herculean heroes like this couldn't solve. This is a story so different from the classic boy and his dog because Toothless is much more than just a pet to Hiccup, or a best friend. He is his other half, they complete each other, one cannot function without the other. No wonder Hiccup looked at him and saw himself, because they are one and the same. Both have something missing in them that become complete when they're together. In Toothless he found his purpose, his calling. So what is Hunter Trainer Dragon about? 
about the bond between a boy and a dragon. Vikings are at war with the dragons. Do me a favor and substitute dragons with another Viking tribe. Another group of people that misunderstand and attack each other. So, what is How to Train Our Dragon really about? The entire trilogy screams one message. We are stronger together. It's about unity. It's about differences making us stronger. The key to ending a war wasn't more war. It was compassion and love. How to Train Our Dragon was my first fandom. I fell in love with this movie at 14 years old and was obsessed with it for years. What was it about this movie that just enchanted me at that age? Was it because I saw myself in Hiccup? Well, of course. Of course I did. At his age, I was an outcast. Everyone else around me belonged and were sure of who they were. I was not. My classmates were like their parents, ready to fill in their shoes when they got older. I was not. And like Hiccup, at some point I came of age and grew up. The worldview I had when I was 14 is not the same I have now. But even after I left the franchise because of general disinterest and I watched this movie years later as research for this video, it still made me remember what it was like to be a kid and stare out the windows of my classroom and imagine I was flying in the sky on a dragon. And if all the growing up I went through taught me anything, it's that someday we all eventually learn to look into the eyes and understand and bond with and eventually train the dragon inside of us. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know I did. I really, really love this movie, and every second of it is a lesson in storytelling. If you liked the video, consider liking and subscribing so you can see more of my content. But just taking the time to watch means the world to me just the same. As usual, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.